Second Thought. Hey there, I'm JT from Second Thought. Being a socialist can get you down sometimes. That's why it's so important to take a few minutes every once in a while to focus on the good things. If you can look past all the horrible stuff going on, there are always dedicated people putting in the work to build a better future. Let's look at some recent examples. The Ganawake Bay Restoration is a powerful example of the importance of indigenous governance. Ganawake was once a small archipelago of lush natural islands, but it became a single piece of land after sludge from the river and blasted rock was dumped onto the archipelago by construction crews about 70 years ago. To make matters worse, in 1959, Canada and the United States cut off the community's access to the river, replacing the natural waterway with a narrow canal for large cargo ships, and expropriating the 1,262 acres for a mass industrial project. This was one of the most traumatic events that the community experienced. For decades, the island was rocky and arid, but the Ganawake Environment Protection Office stepped in, initiating a community-driven, indigenous-led land conservation and restoration project. Now the bay is a peaceful oasis, complete with a protected nesting area for turtles and a habitat for the at-risk bank swallows migrating through the area. Lynn Jacobs, the former director of Kepo, said she's already noticed how many more species there are now, with bank swallows flying over the marsh by the hundreds. Cody Diabo, council chief responsible for the environment portfolio at the Mohawk Council of Kanawake, said, Hearing the birds, hearing the insects, and just being able to see visually how beautiful it is, this is a good day. Remember, folks, it's land back here and everywhere. On the 26th of July, tech workers from Amazon and Google demonstrated at the annual Amazon Web Services Summit in New York City, holding pro-worker, pro-Palestine solidarity signs with anti-capitalist sentiments. Workers disrupted the keynote speech, shouting, free, free Palestine, no tech for Israel's crimes. Some of the signs read, Israeli apartheid genocide funded by the US, and Amazon profits off of Israel's military occupation. The effort was part of their continuing two-year No Tech for Apartheid campaign intended to make tech companies like Google and Amazon stop profiting off Israeli apartheid and settler colonial violence. Free, free Palestine. Over 800 academics and cultural personalities around the world signed a letter that calls the Israeli occupation of Palestine apartheid. The letter, titled The Elephant in the Room, highlights the direct link between Israel's recent attack on the judiciary and its illegal occupation of millions of Palestinians in the occupied Palestinian territories. Signatories call for numerous actions, particularly from the U.S. Jewish community, including support for the Israeli protest movement, support for human rights organizations defending Palestine, a commitment to revolutionize the curricula for Jewish young people, and for leaders in the U.S. to do what is needed to end the occupation. This letter is significant since it's garnered support from a large number of Jewish intellectuals. Professor Omer Bartov, who teaches Holocaust and Genocide Studies in the U.S., said that the broad inclusion of so many academics representing a stunningly broad spectrum of distinguished Jewish voices indicates a watershed moment in American Jewish views about Israel, and a new willingness by public figures, reflecting the sentiments of the younger generation, to honestly criticize Israel's policies. Ontario Steelworkers of the United Steelworkers Union ended a six-week strike at National Steelcar after winning significant contractual gains. 87.4% of union members ratified the three-year collective agreement that will provide a 13% wage increase plus a $1,000 signing bonus, a $1 per hour wage increase for skilled trades members, improved pension plans, as well as increased health and safety measures. Miles Sullivan, USW District 6 director, stated, I want to applaud every one of the 1,475 steelworkers at National Steel Car. Your win at the picket line and at the bargaining table sends a message that workers will no longer stand by and get left behind as corporations and CEOs rake in profits. It also echoes the demands of thousands of workers across the country who have had enough of greedy and negligent employers, and who are fighting back and taking action. The United Steelworkers have won the hearts of many unions and organizations in Canada, as they consistently show up in solidarity with other movements, and even anti-fascist demonstrations, as unions should. Rock on, Steelworkers. Solidarity forever. In late July, Starbucks Workers United, alongside other leftist groups, hit the streets of Philadelphia. The demonstration, called The Union is Calling, was an organized bus tour of 13 cities, including Minneapolis-St. Paul, Atlanta, Chicago, Knoxville, Louisville, Pittsburgh, Buffalo, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Eugene, Portland, and Seattle. 
The Starbucks Workers United Union comprises 335 Starbucks stores in 38 states and the District of Columbia. Starbucks, however, has failed to negotiate in good faith with the union, while continuing to rack up hundreds of federal labor violations. Organizers in Philadelphia called on city officials to remove a non-union Starbucks store from city-owned property, and speakers described the poor treatment of workers and the company's illegal union-busting campaign. The union's nine core demands include the ability to organize, rights such as cause employment, worker safety, fair wages, access to health care, consistent schedules, increased leave of absence and time off, as well as access to the withheld benefits corporate officials have only given non-union employees. As long as they keep up the pressure, the corporate lackeys are bound to lose. People's movements around the world rallied this month for the Let Cuba Live campaign, demanding that Cuba be removed from the US state sponsors of terrorism list. Organizers include the International People's Assembly, Foro de Sao Paulo, Trade Union Federation of the Americas, World March of Women, Continental Latin American and Caribbean Network in Solidarity with Cuba, and La Via Campesina. They're aiming to obtain more than a million signatures on a letter that will be delivered to President Biden, demanding that Cuba be removed from the list. The letter states that Cuba's inclusion on the list makes it much harder for Cuba to make transactions using international banking systems and acquire necessary goods on the international market such as fuel, food, construction supplies, hygiene products, and medicine. The movement has already collected signatures from high-profile names such as Peter Mertens, president of the Belgian Workers' Party, feminist scholar Judith Butler, and Evo Morales, the former president of Bolivia. The general secretary of Morena said of the movement, This is an invitation to gather more than one million signatures. For all of us who are aware of what is happening in Cuba, of the measures being taken by the US government and their effects on the Cuban people, to sign this form, in this campaign to let Cuba live, because no person in the world should be subjected to the decisions of another country, secretly powerful, to prevent the possibility of living in peace. On Thursday, August 3rd, as many as 90,000 accredited social health activists united in the capital of India's Bihar state, Patna, calling for the state government to meet their demands. If the government fails to do so, they threaten to intensify their mobilization. The protesters were organized by a joint platform of various unions and associations. Among other demands, they call for a regular monthly wage equivalent to 120 US dollars, instead of the current 12 US dollars a month as well as government employee status and pensions. All power to the workers. Staff at a lodge for LNG workers in Canada's under construction facility in Kitimat, BC have won wage increases of up to 40%, averting a strike. The workers union, Unite Here Local 40, stated the new deal was reached after the 450 hospitality workers at Cedar Valley Lodge unanimously voted in favor of ratifying the new contract. The union says this means most employees will receive a 30 to 40% pay bump over a one-year contract, while lodge workers will immediately get $5 more hourly, and maintenance staff will see an immediate 10% pay spike. On top of that, employees will receive increased vacation pay, improvements to medical benefits, a new retirement plan, and workload protections for kitchen, janitor, and housekeeping roles. It just goes to show how even the threat of a strike holds incredible power. Remember, the boss needs you, you don't need them, and the union makes us strong. On July 27th, US-based Korean activists protested outside the US Department of State in Washington, DC, demanding an end to the 70-year-long Korean War and the travel ban on North Korea. Activists also delivered 1,000 individually signed postcards and an open letter endorsed by 62 organizations addressed to President Joe Biden and Secretary of State Antony Blinken, which support the abolition of the US travel ban. These demonstrations are the result of a week of workshops, rallies, and meetings with lawmakers organized by US-based peace groups such as Women Cross DMZ, No Do Tall for Korean Community Development, Code Pink, and Korea Peace Now. Kathy Choi, director of policy and organizing at Women Cross DMZ, said this support speaks to the widespread will of the American public to see a swift end to this draconian travel ban. The DMZ and travel bans forcibly split up Korean families to this day. Solidarity with this powerful movement. Venezuela has won a lawsuit against the Portuguese bank Novo Banco, recovering over $1.5 billion worth of assets frozen in the bank since 2019. These assets were supposed to fund medicines, food products, and other essential supplies for Venezuela. The District Court of Lisbon, Portugal declared the judicial appeal filed by the Venezuelan government well-founded, 
and ordered the immediate release of the money to various Venezuelan public entities. This marks the latest victory of the Bolivarian Republic and its people against sanctions imposed by the US and frozen funds in various international banks. Foreign Minister Ivan Gil celebrated the win as the result of a long battle and above all of the resistance of the Venezuelan people and the government of Nicolas Maduro, who do not allow themselves to be subdued by threats from imperialism and coup attempts. On July 29th and 30th, over 250 people from the Workers' World Party branches in Seattle, Portland, and New York City united in the People's Summit against the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation, or APEC. APEC is a neoliberal free trade conference where, in the words of International League of People struggle, government and big business collude to prioritize corporate profits at the expense of the global working class and poor. Attendees agreed on the necessity for a united front in the fight against imperialism and capitalism, and workshops discussed how to organize for a revolution and encourage working class solidarity. The summit ended with a rally from Cal Anderson Park to the Seattle Convention Center Summit Building to confront members of APEC. Speeches were given at the center discussing themes of international solidarity, people's power, and the role of US imperialism as the main cause of the worldwide oppression of workers. Remember, Western comrades, that imperialism is the primary contradiction, and it's your responsibility to do everything in your power to end it. On the 8th of August, Issue 1, a right-wing movement attempting to prevent abortion access legislation was crushed by a record turnout. For over a century, Ohioans have been able to amend the state constitution via a majority. The failed attempt of Issue 1 would have changed that threshold to 60%, making it more difficult to amend the state constitution. But 57% of the voters said no, rejecting this measure and ensuring that access to abortion is enshrined, a significant win for reproductive justice. Ready for a laugh? Graham Linehan, a famous transphobe known for being banned from Twitter and his wife leaving him, tried to do his anti-trans comedy show in Edinburgh this month. He had booked the Leith Arches, but once the pro-LGBTQ venue learned what he planned to perform, they quickly cancelled on him. He claimed to have a second venue, which also cancelled. In the end, he resorted to doing his show outside of Parliament to about four guys. Credit to him, that is very funny. Ecuadorians have rejected oil drilling in a protected area of the Amazon, putting an end to operations in a region that is home to isolated indigenous groups and important biodiversity. With over 90% of the ballots counted at 60% voter turnout, Ecuadorians rejected the oil exploitation within Yasuni National Park. The park is inhabited by the Tagheri and Taromanani, alongside other indigenous peoples. In 1989, it was registered, along with neighboring areas, as a World Biosphere Reserve by the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, also known as UNESCO. Covering a surface area of around 1 million hectares, the area comprises 610 species of birds, 139 species of amphibians, and 121 species of reptiles. At least three species are native to this area, and can be found nowhere else globally. Nemo Gikita, a leader of the Warani tribe, said, Ecuadorians have come together for this cause to provide a life opportunity for our indigenous brothers and sisters, and also to show the entire world, amidst these challenging times of climate change, that we stand in support of the rainforest. On Thursday, August 3rd, the Glasgow Sheriff Court acquitted activist Nathan Hennebury of the Young Communist League, charged during the 2021 COP26 climate protest. Hennebury was one of over 50 people arrested during the course of the protests, but he was the only one facing a trial, as Scottish police were allegedly attempting to target the YCL and the Communist Party. During COP26, over 100,000 activists from leftist climate action groups and youth groups united on the streets demanding concrete proposals from the summit to prevent further climate catastrophe. The YCL group that held banners which read Socialism or Extinction was heavily monitored by the police. Hennebury was accused of being in possession of a flare that could have caused injury to police during the march. According to a Morning Star report, the case against Hennebury fell through after two police witnesses at the trial gave differing accounts of the incident. Following the verdict in the case, the Communist Party of Britain demanded an end to the attacks on communists, trade unionists, and environmentalists, the repeal of Tory laws expanding police powers and attacking the right to protest, and real action to save the planet and humanity from climate change. Australian scientists of Sturt National Park successfully reintroduced locally extinct species to safe zones in a nation home to one of the world's worst mammal extinction rates. The experiment is called Wild Deserts, 
and is run by the University of New South Wales in partnership with NSW Parks and Wildlife, whose aim is to return indigenous extinct animals to locations they once inhabited. To achieve this aim, scientists have fenced off 40 square kilometers, providing a pest-free safe haven for species to breed and learn to coexist. Scientists released 27 of the mammals a year ago, and there are now an estimated 120. Ecologist and project coordinator Rhys Pedler said, We've reintroduced bilbies and shark bay bandicoots, and golden bandicoots and some other species are to come in the next few years. For the first time in US history, a Montana state court ruled on August 14th in favor of Montana youths that the state violated their right to a clean and healthful environment through its promotion of the use of fossil fuels. This represents a landmark victory for climate activists who have, for decades, been attempting to hold governments to account for turning a blind eye to CO2 emissions. This is even more astounding considering it involved just 16 Montanans, aged between 5 and 22, who brought the nation's first constitutional and first youth-led climate lawsuit to trial. Undoubtedly, this will inspire other activists and spark further such court cases. Executive Director of Our Children's Trust, Julia Olson, summarized, This is a huge win for Montana, for youth, for democracy, and for our climate. More rulings like this will certainly come. Comrades, if you have good news from the current month, please send your stories to mexi at protonmail.com. Thank you to Javi for the Positive News Jams. Thank you to Cosmo for the Positive News Background. Thank you to Mexi, Catherine, Seb, and Marshall for script writing and production. And thank you to Tristan for editing this video. And to yours truly for hosting this one. If you'd like to support the project, please go to patreon.com slash positive leftist news. Or you can send a one-time tip via PayPal. The link is in the description box below. Yeah, come on, sometimes.